Welcome to Sea Time, everybody, the off-road show that brings you all the results, news, and online shenanigans that make being online a good time. We'd like to say thank you to Fly Racing for their support of Sea Time. Please go check them out at flyracing.com. Welcome to Seat Time, everybody. Brian Pierce here. Luckily, my name has not changed, so it's easy for me to remember which way to what to call myself. Uh, episode 16. Well, episode 116. We are in the hundreds, not just in the the double digits, but the triple digits. Uh, if we had some triple Ds up in here, I'm pretty sure that this uh, episode would be way more entertaining. And if anybody has anybody in the McKinney, Texas area with triple Ds, please send them by. We would love for them to be our co-host regularly here on the show. Now that we've already completely gone off topic and talked about breast, I think we know it's going to be one hell of a good episode. Uh, so Seat Time, the online show for the off-road enthusiasts. If you enjoy beer drinking, bench racing, and uh, riding a dirt bike every now and again involved with those other things, I'm pretty sure that you have found the right show. Um, so, yeah. Here, we're going to talk to a great guest this evening. So we're going to start off with Fred Andrews here in a couple minutes. And then, of course, after that, we're going to have uh, a name maybe not well-known in the dirt bike community um, by the names of James Wilson. Um, but I have a feeling he's going to have some really good information for us. And then after that, we're going to finish up with Mark Kiria. Now, I know I pronounced his last name wrong. Uh, he has given me shit for that before. And uh, we're going to talk to him on the line uh, when he comes on and ask him specifically how we could pronounce his last name and stop screwing it up all of the time so seat time we wouldn't be here without our great sponsors um one of them would be fly racing uh as soon after we have are done with mr uh, andrews we're gonna have our pint full of awesome award uh given away and we've got a really really cool prize uh, i actually wish that i could have one of these bad boys for sure so uh stay tuned in for that of course by this point i'm not going to be looking at instagram twitter or facebook so if you're going to post now it's going to be submitted for next week but remember that you can always uh hashtag everything with pint full of awesome and you will be submitted that's easy enough for everybody to do out there um so thanks to fly for that and then of course for this evening fast company so if you've thought about man i don't know why my hands hurt so much maybe i've got some arm pump all that kind of stuff you should probably talk to the guys over at Fast Company. They got the flex bars, easy, easy way for you to get rid of all that kind of stuff and have way more control over your bike and less thought process over why do I have to hold on so tight. Makes it very simple for everybody. Of course, seat time. Uh, easy to find us. If for some reason you're not watching us live, you can find us on YouTube uh, if you'd like to watch. If you'd just like to listen, maybe while you're at work or driving to work, uh, you can easily search for us. seat time, two words on Stitcher or iTunes. Um, and yeah, you can download us right there. It's really easy and simple. We appreciate all that stuff. Seattime.bigcartel.com is where you can find some swag that you can purchase to help support Seat Time. We would appreciate that. Unfortunately, technology is not free. We keep trying to push the boundaries of screwing it up. So go out there and please support everybody that supports Seat Time, including us. We would really, really appreciate it. Um, so yes, episode 116, the Triple D, bringing it in hot. So our first guest this evening, Mr. Fred Andrews, as we like to say, how is your evening going, kind sir? It's going really good. Going good tonight. So it's Tuesday for you. Now, Tuesday in Texas, obviously, we're always doing seat time, so we're doing something crazy, something goofy here on the couch. Well, what is what does your typical Tuesday evenings look like? Well, I just uh, went outside and fed my chickens and shut them all up. It's like four degrees out here. I got to make sure the poor things don't freeze up. Uh, so, so, like you have to do with horses and put blankets on them. Do you have to have little chicken chicken blankets that you put on them? Yeah, I got a couple of heat lights out there, but the problem is they get off the eggs and they go out in the morning and they're frozen solid. Uh oh. You're not so, going to have a very good breakfast if your eggs are frozen, will you? Nope, and then I got my German Shepherd bringing them up to me thinking that they're a ball, and he wants to play with them. So <laughs> That could be kind of awkward. See, my son does that with everything. He's a year and a half old uh, yesterday, and he's, everything is ball, ball, and he's just like walking around carrying stuff, and it's just like ball, ball, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, it sounds like a chicken. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of ridiculous. But, hey, year and a half old, I can only imagine the crap that I put my parents through uh, the way that I've turned out. I can imagine that it was qu something quite special. So you – uh, recently, I would say about three or four weeks ago, we had some really big news announced in the fact that you joined the guys over at KR4, um, uh, specifically, I believe, to help out a lot with their Arrive and Ride program, but I'd imagine that you have um, a lot of other duties that are going to be kind of more KR4 specific as well behind that. So it, it, I would almost say that 
announcements in July in January feel late considering that the season kind of starts off in March. So was there any so one just kind of tell us about the announcement, you know, exactly the specifics of that and then maybe why, you know, it kind of took so long for for the announcement to come out. Well, the whole time, you know, we had the Husky team for 3 years and we talked with them and we thought everything was going good with them and it came out that Husky decided to bring everything in-house like KTM does it, so that kind of left me without a job. And I kind of looked around the industry at different things, and KR4 had a great program going on, and I've been with friends with Frankie for a long, long time. And him and I kind of started talking, and at the banquet, we actually talked about me joining the team. And, you know, it was kind of late in the year. You know, everybody was kind of set in their ways, and sponsors were done. But I joined up, and... Um, Shook things up a little bit and got some of my loyal sponsors, you know, like Fly and Pro Circuit and Maxis, come on board and um, made things happen. You know, it's kind of a big change going from a performance-based program to a family-oriented program. And, you know, like the grassroots, that's where we all start from. We all go to the races to have fun with the family and enjoy racing. And that's what Care 4 is all about. You know, we lease motorcycles out to people that, maybe want to come try a race or two and you know it's real expensive to fly from California back here and do it and then you know or a parent with mini bike kids you know they really don't really know how to work on a bike all that well and we're going to the races and we customize programs for the young kids to come racing and their parents come and enjoy it and everybody has fun everybody goes home happy and we work on the bikes during the week and we're there the next weekend right um I I just uh, specifically you said uh, bikes for them to lease I was wondering a uh, how how your program kind of works in that sense because um, are there abilities for people as well to have their specific bike the way it's set up for them with you guys for for you all to prep that bike and have it delivered uh, have it arrive and ready to ride at um, at the next GNCC or sometimes the National Enduro since you guys are going to be doing that as well or is it just kind of a lease program uh, per nope. race. Nope, nope. You can give us your bike, and we'll prep your bike and bring it to the races. Um, actually, for some of the NEPGs, like going to Texas out your way and going yep. to Colorado, we're actually going to haul some bikes for guys, you know, and that way they can fly and they can train all week long. They can jump on a plane Friday, come out and do the race, fly home, be back and be trained again and keep themselves fit for the races. Very cool. Is there any chance offhand that you're going to be uh, handling Zach Huberty's bike for him? Uh, I don't think so. I haven't heard from Zach. Okay. Well, we like we like to give Zach as much uh, much uh, crap as we can on the show. Pretty much any chance we have to mention his name, because he feels like now uh, that we steal all of his information. So, which <laughs> which which I'm not going to say is not true. But hey, if you're going to scour anybody's Facebook page, make sure it's Zach's. That's all I got to say. Well, um, hey, if he wants if he wants his bike called, give us a call. We'll help anybody out. We're uh, we're here to help. Yeah, I know for sure. So I, I just kind of wanted to know um, a little bit more of you. You mentioned it quite, I think, a way that I haven't heard said is that when the Husky team came about with the, the new ownership of Husky, that that management of that team was brought in house. Um, KTM uh, definitely does do a lot in house. They do not like to contract out. Um, even when it comes down to their video production department, I know that they don't like the fact of uh, certain employees that they have to contract out. They they don't they can't have complete control of them over in California. Um, was there any discussion of you possibly working with Husqvarna in house in California or, or through the shop in California? No, not really. Um, I went to Italy and thought we were going to have the program here. Uh, FAR was now the program for Husky Husky again. We went with Andrew over to Italy. We did good over there, and we came back. And my boss at the time, Andy Jefferson, called me and said that corporate had made a decision to do it all in-house instead of having us do it, which I kind of knew it was going to go that way, but I thought you know we'd get another year because we kind of had things going back east, and with them doing it from out, out west, it's really hard for them to – make it happen back here. I mean, they hired my mechanic. I had Joey Maurer, so he's going to be a big asset to Andrew and oh, for sure. uh, Russell Bobbitt. And uh, they're based in their place here out of Ohio, so it's kind of weird. But, um, you know, everything happens for a reason, and uh, I'm happy to be with at KR4. It's uh, been really fun, and it's going to be fun. You know, it's like you, when you were a kid, didn't you ever want to 
show up at a race, have your bike there underneath the tent, be like a factory rider, and you know, you're just a little kid. You know, some kids are never going to get that chance to be under the KTM tent or under Randy Hawkins's tent, you know, and this is their way to feel what it's like, you know, and it, plus, you know, it may help them. It may give them that little extra drive they need to say, hey, I like this. I really want to be underneath that big factory tent. Let's go do it and try harder. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting that you said that. I would be. I can imagine now that, say, like, we were talking about my son, Liam, 18 months old. So, obviously, you know, I've got him on a kick bike right now, walking around, trying to get him just used to even being on that. Um, my goal is to have him on a bicycle by three um, and by three and a half to four, at least on a dirt bike. By no means will he be fast, but he'll have protective gear and trying to figure it out. That's my hopes. Um and, and I'm not trying to get him on that early in the sense of trying to get him to be some pro racer, just so that there's never any built up fear, um, that there's really no chance for it not to be normal in that sense. So we can always kind of ride together as he grows up. But if the, you know, if he turns out to be like myself, unfortunately, you know, your average B rider as he pretty much moves through the ranks. Um, but he's like, Hey dad, let's go do the Iron Man. Um, okay, cool. Well, you're right. It would typically be, you know, a 17 to 19 hour drive for us both ways, um, you know, 17, 18 up, 17, 18 back, hauling the bikes, all that kinds of stuff. So it would be a four to five day adventure. It would be a family trip for us to have to do that. But with programs like y'all's, you know, we get the okay from Mama Bear and we leave all the girls here at home for a little bit and him and I might be able to fly out there. You guys have some bikes for us able to ride. You know, I'd be in the vet class at that point, might be B, if one time he's 12 again, and he's going to be whatever class he's in. But I could see that being a fantastic adventure for him and I. And I agree. It would have been so cool for my father and I to have been able to do something like that because it would have made it a little bit more a little bit more easier to do. You look at guys that go out and do ski trips. They don't own ski equipment. They fly out there, rent it, and go home and have a great trip, and they get insurance and don't pay for whatever they broke. So... <laughs> And, and, and too, you know, when you come back to GNCC, you kind of don't, don't know what's going on. You know, you show up, we take care of you. If you need gear, we can get you gear. You need helmets, I mean, you need tires, you get the bike. We show you where sign-up is. We, you know, we walk the track with you. And, the, you know, that's the big thing for the young kids, too, you know. We got a mini rider coming out of Canada, uh, <clears throat> Jamie ba Baskerville. He's a Canadian champion. He's coming down, and like I talked to his dad, they couldn't afford to drive down every weekend. Well, right. now we're going to haul their bikes, and they're going to fly in for the races. We're going to prep them. We're going to get them ready for them. Um, you know, it's just people like that really makes it fun, makes it easy for them. Right. Um, now, now, you know me. I don't like to backtrack too much, but one thing we did have a question from uh, from Zach Huberty from Innovation Off-Road. This is he, We're kind of giving him a little bit of chance to ask questions that maybe I don't think of asking, uh, off-the-cuff kind of stuff every now and again. And he, he wanted to know, um, was there much effort going on behind the scenes to keep Andrew DeLong with, uh, with the FAR off-road team that if you were trying to put one together after you knew at that point that you weren't going to be working with Husky for 2014? Oh, for sure. I mean, when I found out that the Husky was going to do it in-house, I, I went shaking every tree I could to find somebody to help us out because, you know, Andrew's going to be a champion and uh, we helped him out to get to where he's at and I wish him all the luck and if I could have kept him, I sure would have. Um, he's a great kid and he wants it as bad as I did. It kind of reminded me of myself when I was younger and it's uh, it's fun to work with somebody that, you know, thanks you and really, uh, I mean, this is Andrew's life. He really wants to do it. So, and he's got Joey with him now, so they got a good program going and I look for them to uh, really open up some eyeballs this year. Wicked. Well, um, so how, and, and I don't, I, I think what you guys at KR4 are doing with the Arrive and Ride and then the kind of the Ready to Race program as well that Dirtwise is putting on, um, I think they're fantastic for the sport. They're going to give a lot more people the opportunity to get out to these type of races that they may not have been able to get out to before and enjoy them um, and to have a good time and have very much, very supportive from you guys. And not to, I don't mean to put you guys head to head, but it, it kind of explain to us how your program works, you know, versus, I guess, what we'd say some of the other programs that are out there. So we know kind of where where to differentiate and maybe make decisions on which program we would then choose um, to, to, you know, to be able to have a rental from. Well, basically, you pick a place where you want to go, event you want to race at. You call us up and we have a bike. I mean, we've customized our programs. You know, we've got bikes, we've got gear. We've got everything you need. You just tell us what you want and we customize a program for you. 
Cool. Are, are you um, in charge I'm, of the uh, of the UTV side of things as well for right now? No, actually, the UTV is done by another by another man. Frank and him are doing it. Uh, Pat's doing that. You know, with with the motorcycle part, there's so much stuff going on. You know, when I had two riders with the FAR team, it was pretty easy getting stuff. You know, and now I've got I think we've got 12 or 13 guys going to the first round. So, you know, that's a lot of coordinating going on and make sure things run smooth. And uh, we got some exciting news today. We signed Shane Hufford to be our XC2 guy for next year. Awesome. And him and uh, Ian Blythe are going to be in XC2 class. So that's real exciting to have uh, Shane want to be part of us and grow with us. Yeah, for sure. Um, is that going to be uh, GNCC and National Enduro with Shane? Because I know he as well was competing in the National Enduros for the past couple of years. Yeah, you know, I'm going to take Shane with me to some of them. Whichever ones he feels he can make and wants to do, he's going to jump in the truck with me and we're going to travel together. Awesome. So how do you think the program has evolved? Now, I know this is your first year being involved with it. But being that they kind of had it going last year and where you guys are at in this year, how full do you feel you are? How much more growth do you think you have? Or do you feel you're right where you need to be to be successful to continue to grow the program? Or do you feel maybe that uh, the, the, the word isn't out yet and that people aren't taking full advantage? That's what, Yeah, I think we're the best kept secret out there, I think. And that's what I'm going to try to do this year and I will do is – introduce care for more to the public because people really don't know exactly what we do that's where we're going to go into the national enduros to explain everybody there what we do so you know next year the enduro park can be bigger and grow where the gncc they had a couple guys last year um i came in and billy's been working hard and frank's been working hard and we got more people this year so it's it's growing slowly, which is a good thing because as you grow slow, you learn. You know, you grow too fast and get too much going on, and then things fall through the cracks and your program goes down. So we're growing good at a good steady pace. We're learning as we go, and things are only going to get better. No, for sure. And so you mentioned Shane Hufford as your as a as another XT2 rider uh, next to Ian Blythe. Um, what about an XC1 rider? We know that you guys were working with uh, Chris Bach last year. Um, he's now going to be on the JCR Honda team. Um, so what do you guys, have you, are you guys talking to anybody, uh, for potential XC1 riders? Um, or is that maybe just a spot right now that you guys, uh, aren't looking to fill? No, right now, you know, XC1 guy would cost a lot of money to have a real good guy. You know, we're not, we're not really into that. We're kind of, we want to help the average person because if the average guy doesn't come to the races, there is no XC1 guy or XC2 guys. You know, we are fortunate to be able to put a program to bet together with Shane and Ian to have XC2 guys but you know we're more about helping that young kid or the dad that works all weekend long the businessman that wants to go racing on the weekend and he can't prep his bike at home and get it in the truck and drive to the races so you know we're we're kind of shifting gears to the you know there's only a few guys that are ever going to make pro row and be underneath the top 10 and be in those positions and there's a lot more amateurs uh, recreational riders and people that want to be under the KR4 tent, be pampered like a pro and just enjoy what they do. You know, you're spending your good money, you want to make sure things are done right, set up, you come to the races, everything's, you know, you just, I can tell you what's going on and we go do it and you have fun at the end of the day, you said, man, that was really worth my while and I want to do it again. Very cool. No, I, I'm excited about this. One of the things, uh, so Steven, our, our buddy uh, behind the scenes, if you will, he's the producer of the show. Uh, he is actually a very, very large uh, 4x4 enthusiast. So uh, they used to do a bunch of buggies, like uh, sand dunes and stuff like that, and they've kind of gone over to the UTV side of things. So we had the wild hair up our ass that it would be a ton of fun one weekend when there's a UTV race and – uh, a dirt bike race at the same venue on the same weekend that we could go out there on a Saturday and do a UTV lease event. Um, and then on the Sunday I could, he, I mean, he could do the dirt bike as well, but I'm pretty sure it would be more of a, of a clown car type event than anything else if he did that. Yeah. But then I could do the dirt bike event on Sunday and then we could fly home Sunday night. Um, so uh, in terms of us even thinking about something like that, does that sound like something that you guys would still be able to, to cater to? Now, obviously, we don't, we wouldn't need the pampering type stuff. We just want to go out there, have a good time, and make sure there's a six pack at the end of each day. But, you know. Yeah, you know, uh, the UTV thing actually grew. You know, we thought maybe only having one vehicle, and Pat got one all done up, and 
man, it's just going through the roof. We get a lot, a lot of inquiries about doing that. And, you know, he actually went out and bought another one. So I know he's at least got two and maybe even three of them go, uh, for the races for the next year. So what you're telling me is if, 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 if there's any bit of this wild hair up our ass that could be true, we need to talk to Frank now. <laughs> yeah, you better get on that quick because uh, there's a lot of people, that, you know, they want to get in that UTV like you said. They want to go out there and I think I'd have, to, I'd have to be the driver. I don't know if I'd trust somebody else driving me. Actually, my country singer buddy, Craig Morgan, and I, I think – we're going to do one in his Artie Cat. Oh, that would be awesome. That dude's a cool cat, man. One, he's a good country singer, and two, he's just a down-to-earth, like, super, super, you know, down-to-earth dude. Yeah, that would be cool. I'd let him drive me around because he seems like yeah. he probably gets a little crazy, but his little crazy is much less than my little crazy. <laughs> so I think I'd be okay with him driving. Now, I think it would be a ta- – I mean, Stephen and I may have to physically fight to see who would ha- who would be able to drive or – we would just say, you know what? F it. We're doing, you're getting two laps, I'm getting two laps. Like, we just do two laps, stop, switch, put everything back on, and go again and just say whatever. You know, we're, we're not there to race. We're there for the experience, just like a lot of the, the younger kids would be, except we would be plus 30-something in, in a UTV with big, muddy grins on our faces. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a cool thing. Maybe that's something we can put, put to the GNCC, have a uh, buddy race. Race two laps, switch. And the other guy gets to drive. Yeah. Ooh. Hey, now. That's some more excitement to it. Somebody, while we're live, somebody tweet that idea to GNCC and see if we can get them to bite. Jen Kenyon loves it when I tweet her. If you can see me shaking my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, but who wouldn't want to tweet Jen Kenyon? You know what I'm saying? Oh. Just kidding. I love you all. All right. So tell us a little bit about you being badass from like 1993 to sometime in the 2000s. So you've been racing GNCCs that long? Yeah, I started GNCCs in 1993. I was doing the motocross nationals. I did the pro motocross from 84 to 93. I did supercross and did all that and was getting old. And uh, my brother raced the GNCC the year before, and he said, you got to try the one in Ocala. So I said, okay. I raced the motocross on Sunday, the Pro National. Now on Tuesday, I went to Ocala and banged bars with uh, Scott Summers, found out that running into an XR600 is like hitting an army tank. And uh, we had a lot of fun there. I won that race, and that, you know, with that, my off-road career started. Nice. And then uh, was it the – was it the Blackwater that you said that you were banging bars with Scott Summers, or was that a different GNCC event? I banged bars with Scott Summers from day one. Yeah. He was, uh, <laughs> he was the man in the thing, and I was the cocky motocross guy that wasn't letting nobody stand in my way. And uh, We had our run-ins, but you know, we had a lot of fun, and I think we helped the sport grow because we had a lot of controversy going between both of us, and we got a lot of press for – hating each other or running into each other and I didn't want to get beat by him and I can remember Mitch Payton telling me I'd call him on Mondays and he'd say hey you didn't let that lawnmower beat you again did you, <laughs> you know, that's when four strokes weren't the bike to have you know two stroke everybody was a two stroke yeah, I say, yeah he beat me again so uh, I have to ask since you were racing Scott Summers around then I know you know the ad where he's he's lifting that big old XR600 up I have to. Was that a was that real or was that Photoshop? Do you know? Oh no, he could he he could do it. He just picked it right up. He was he was strong. It didn't look like he was that big, but my hats off to him, man. He was a great rider for riding that bike as fast as he did. Because I swore, ain't no way a six hundred can go that fast through the woods, man. And he did it. Oh my gosh, that's insane. Well, cool. So Blackwater one hundred, uh, you won that in ninety three. Um, how many other times did you race it? Well, that, I only got to race Blackwater one time, and that was 93, and that was the last year they had it. Okay, well, that makes sense. Historians, actually, historians would shake fingers at me. I passed Randy Hawkins about four miles from the finish to win that race. Heck, yeah. Randy Hawkins, that guy. Psh, that's a nobody. Come on. You're, uh, you're Fred Andrews, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so, no, it's so probably, crazy uh, that y'all's names are... He's probably are... my best friend in the, in the off-road racing, old Randy, as we've done a lot of things together, and we have a lot of fun together. Oh, I bet, man. I bet you guys have some great stories, too, some campfires that uh, that just stay very personal, and uh, once somebody hears something, they don't take it too far, because you guys probably have some, uh, some great stories from back in the day. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. You know, we just never... Uh, we're both coming out of the same mold, kind of. We're both kind of... Our motorcycle was everything. We didn't do too much other than race our bikes. And uh, 
that's about it really you know we now we hunt a lot so hopefully one of these days we're going to get to go on a hunt together and have fun there too awesome well dude before we let you go obviously we want to know one did we miss anything make sure you fill us in on all the goods how people can get in touch with you guys how people can get information how we can get information from you guys to learn more because obviously you know we're interested um and then i wanted to give a big shout out to curtis palmer um he is a kr4 rider he's been in the chat room um, a bunch lately as we've been going live on this Tuesday night. So big shout out to him. I wanted to know what you thought about Curtis and best thing about him and maybe the one thing that he needs to work on going into 2014. Well, I haven't spent a whole lot of time with Curtis. I know talking to him on the phone, he's really dedicated and he wants to uh, see how far he can go. You know, maybe this could be his career. And he's, you know, that's the main thing. When you find somebody like him, he wants to do it. It's not well, yeah, I guess I'll try it. You know, he's got the drive, and you can't put the drive in somebody, so that's a plus for him. So I'm really excited to work with him and try to help him any way I can. Um, as far as care for goes, I mean, you go to our website, and basically we can mold a program. Or work, we can custom fit a program for anybody's needs. You know, if it's hauling a bike or renting a bike or us just working on it or, you know, come see us at the races. We're going to be at all the races. Uh, any, anything they want to know, they can go to the website or email us and we can tell them what's going on. Um, we got some exciting other riders on the team. You know, we got Corey Stee. She's the girls champion last year. She's back with us. We got uh, Carlene Bean, which is Billy's daughter. She's racing the women's class, which I think they call it the XCW this year. But we got Curtis on the team. Um, we got the Canadian champ coming down. We got Shane. We got Ian. We got a couple guys from Finland coming in the first round. There you uh, go. We got Nick Davis, his little brother on the team now, Grant Davis. So, uh, man, we got a lot of fun going on, and that's what it's all about. You know, racing, when you get into pro ranks, it gets real serious, and you kind of lose a little bit of why you started doing it. You know, it comes to be uh, you want to really work on making money, and, you know, we're here for the fun part of it. Let's go have some fun and ride a motorcycle. That's what I'm talking about. Well, I have to say I am going to email Frank when this is all over and uh, we're going to start talking. I'm going to just tell him, like, listen, we're going to be flying in, flying out. What's the best weekends? Let's figure it out and make it happen because this sounds like a great idea and a great experience. And I'm ready to take part in it, so it'll be a good time. Well, dude, Frank, Fred, Frank, I'm, I'm like talking about Fred, Frank. Frank, Frank. Yeah, from fr frickin' and frackin', frackin' to rah. We appreciate you being on the show, taking the time to come talk to us. Um, I'm hoping this isn't the last time. Um, I'm hoping it's – I know you guys are going to have fun. You're going to have a great year. But hopefully some of your XT, XC2 riders uh, really turn some heads uh, that you guys have a lot of fun this year and you give us a lot of stuff to talk about so that we can have you on again. We can talk about all the fun you all are having and just share, share a pint full of awesome. I think that will be a good time. Well, whenever you want it, give me a shout. I'm glad to be on. I always like to talk and uh... – like I said, we're just trying to introduce Care4 to everybody. It's kind of a secret out there. Nobody really knows, so we're introducing it to everybody. And we're coming your way in Texas for the Enduro. If somebody needs their bikes hauled, give us a shout. Yeah, we're going to be there. So we'll, we'll definitely have to shake hands and uh, meet officially in person because uh, we'll be there racing on Road 23. It'll be I fun. thought we did meet last year when Andrew won. I'm an idiot. See how quickly you forget me? No, it's not that I forget you. It's that I forget everything. <laughs> I literally had to ask my wife, hey, where's my phone? As I am uh, like coming in to do the show. And you know where it was? It was on the couch where I left it, where I was using it to text people. It's a shitty thing to have my, my brain. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Nobody should get older, or at least as dumb as I am. That's what sucks. It's, it's not about age. Dude, we really appreciate it, Fred. Thank you. Have a good night, and we will definitely be talking soon. All right, thank you, and everybody have a good night, and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Later, man. See ya. Woohoo! All right, so cool, cool stuff from Fred Andrews. It was great to talk with him. It was unfortunate that we haven't been able to do that before, but very, very happy to do it. Um, so what's going to be coming up? We're going to get to our next guest in a second, but I wanted to talk about the Pint Full of Awesome Awards and our great, great friends over at Fly Racing. They are such a big supporter of us, and we are so thankful that they were uh, such so helpful and uh, so willing to be supportive of the Pintful of Awesome Award as well. So I, again, took some time to think about who our winner was going to be. Um, and so with this, though, I kind of wanted to say, ooh, wait, Fly Racing? 
what product do you want to give away this time? And they said, ooh, the Roller Grand Bag. This thing is absolutely huge. I even asked, dude, can I get one of those? And I got a big denied sticker on there, which was very, very unfortunate. Um, so with that, though, oh, my gosh, I had to go to their website to check it out and get all the stuff. But this thing is absolutely huge. It has rollers on it so that you can make sure, oh, okay, you get all your, your huge, huge duffel bag if you're going to the airport, if you're unloading it from your truck, if you're dragging it out of your garage. You can get all that stuff easy, easy, easy. You don't have to do like I do and, and get your muscles in your neck all pumped up and warm up just to lift your bag. You can just drag it with nice little rollers. Fantastic. It's huge. It's got one of those fun little mats, too. You can pull the mat out. You can step on it. You don't even have to get dirty before or after you ride your dirt bike. Those two things are big selling points for me because you know me. I am a wuss. I don't like to get dirty or cold because I have little vagina hands and it sucks for everybody. But that's not here nor there. So even if you don't win the Pintful of Awesome Award this evening in about five minutes when I announce it, you still want to go to flyracing.com and you can check out the uh, the roller grand bag. This thing is absolutely huge, totally epic. It's even in a, it's even in a fun black. I mean, who doesn't like black, right? So... As we announce the Pintful of Awesome Award winner, I would just like to say thank you, everyone, that submitted. The hashtags are kicking. It was awesome to see. I think we had over 70 submissions from last week to this week. So that's great for us. We're really, really happy to see all that. Um, and the winner this week was the uh, THM Moto X. I had to give it to the guy. He's been uh, submitting a lot of cool pictures, and the one that he submitted this week was just absolutely epic. Um, in the desert, blowing up a big old trail of dust. GoPro's on there. It even looks like maybe somebody took it professionally. If not, great job. Nice little Instagram filter on there. We'll go with it. It's okay. So big time for him. I really appreciate you guys. I have to say, Cody Klein, keep them coming. I really enjoyed your pictures from last week and the week before. Those were good ones. Uh, Coltrane, our buddy's from Fastco. He had some really good pictures. It was kind of like a warm the heart because of the fact that he had. It was him and his little him and his little kids out ripping and roaring around in the desert. So those were definitely shout out shout out worthy. Um, and Summer Aldridge, um, so one of our first ladies to submit uh, using the hashtag Pintful of Awesome. Um, I have to say, she had a helmet on, but she might be kind of cute. So boys, watch out. Instagram's got ladies. Don't get car- don't get carried away. Follow them because they're cool, not because they're hot. But Summer, keep it going. We really appreciate you getting all the stuff out there. Remember, Pintful of Awesome Award. You get to get free swag from Fly Racing, and all you have to do is use the hashtag Pintful of Awesome. So big thanks to Fly Racing for, one, being a huge supporter of the show, and, two, for uh, helping us bring the Pintful of Awesome Award to you guys. <sighs> I feel like I need a sip of water, but you know what? There's no time for water because we have our second guest on. So I'm going to kind of – you guys who are our typical viewers may not know who this man is. If you do, good on you because you pay attention and you're healthy and you probably are a much better mountain bike racer than I am. But for those of you who don't know, get ready to learn a lot. But I have to ask, Mr. James Wilson – how is your evening going, kind sir? Man, it's going awesome. I don't know that I can uh, quite say it's going as awesome as yours, but uh, I'm going to try to keep up. Hey, if you think I'm energetic, I'm probably just having a bad night. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've been known to be a, li- a little uh, a little crazy at times, and so especially when I get on the couch – Pipe full of awesomes are just flowing. We're just having a good time I love talking it, about man. It. Dude, yeah. pipe full of awesome. That's that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, but so I don't screw it up for our viewers. I wanted you to give us what you think is a decent bio about yourself, what you do on a regular basis, and then I'm going to kind of take from that why I think what you do is is very should be knowledgeable and usable knowledge for our viewers. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I guess in a nutshell, I'm a, I'm a strength coach that really hates the term strength training. Um, <laughs> Understand. And I specialize in training programs for mountain bikers. And, you know, I, I kind of say that, you know, I, I hate the term uh, strength training tongue in cheek because really like at it, it, the heart of what I do is I help people understand how to move better and then how that better movement connects to their sport. And a lot of times when you move better, that's going to show up in the gym is like, you know, increased strength numbers, but increased strength numbers isn't necessarily the, the goal in and of itself. And so that's why sometimes that, that term can be a little misleading is people think like, oh, you know, if I'm strength training, the whole goal is to just like, you know, do more reps, put on more weight and, uh, you know, not necessarily if, if you're an athlete and the gym isn't your sport, then sometimes 
you know, learning to move more efficiently is, uh, is the goal and, and, uh, the, the numbers will take care of themselves. So, you know, that's, that's what I do is I, like I said, I specialize in, in helping mountain bikers understand how, how to improve how they move and how that movement applies to their sport. But, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with, uh, you know, people in, in a lot of different sports and, you know, I've definitely worked with motor riders and, uh, and, and help them with, uh, help them ride better as well with kind of the same principles. But, uh, that's kind of, you know, it in a nutshell. Cool. Well, it's interesting. Um, one of our, um, I wouldn't say extremely, uh, normal guests, but a guy that comes on every now and again to help us talk about health, fitness, eating, a lot of the kind of weird stuff that no, that everybody wants to say they understand, but in reality, none of us probably do very well. Um, right. is, is Coach Seiji, and he was actually he actually is a huge uh, cyclist. He was a professional cyclist for a long time, professional mountain bike racer, um, and then through that became a, a mountain bike coach. And he's on a plane one day and turns in and just starts talking to the guy next to him. Turns out this dude is a huge uh, dirt bike racer, um, you know, uh, I think up and coming kind of supercross racer, and was just like, well, you know, after they, you know, their whole flight, he's just kind of like, well, what would it take for you to train me? And then that was that was his unknown unbeknownst to him introduction to becoming a dirt bike trainer uh for right. supercross and motocross guys so i think that the, when you understand what the the rider wants you as a person who understands how the body needs to function can then you know adapt to what that rider or racer needs um and i, I think yeah. that's that's exactly why you're somebody that i wanted to talk to one um i i'm a pink bike whore um, I, I read that site religiously. That is, that's pretty much my first site that I open up in the morning just to kind of, you know, just to, I guess, get the news, if you will, whatever it is, get the brain going. Um, and, and I love reading your articles, watching your videos and stuff like that. I've done a lot of CrossFit in the past, always enjoyed it. I love that functional movement. I really do. And I get a lot of that from your videos as well. Yeah. So I know just from my personal experience that a lot of dirt bikers in our off-road side of things, we're kind of talk to a lot of off-road racers. A lot of us cross train with mountain biking. Um, yeah. In supercross and motocross, you see a lot of guys starting to do uh, road cycling as well. But I wanted to know some of the, just to kind of get us started, what are some of the key points that you really work with on somebody to make sure that they're not just jumping on a bicycle and going riding and all this, and they think they're getting this efficient ride, um, but in reality, they're just, you know, they're almost doing themselves more harm than good. Are there any kind of main tips that you have for people in that arena? Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess at the at the heart of it, and this is, um, you know, this is something that not a lot of people talk about or think about, but like cardio training is very tension specific. And if you think about it, like, you know, sitting on a road bike and spinning uh, a high RPM, you know, 90 to 100 RPM gear is definitely hard from a cardio standpoint, but it's hard in a different way than, you know, for example, like mountain biking, like, you know, doing a hard trail ride or even doing like downhill runs or even, you know, doing a moto run. There's there's a different kind of hard there. And if, if you really kind of think about it, what is what's the difference and and the difference boils down to the tension demands of the sport you know if you if you think about it like you don't the cardiovascular system responds to the muscular system right you don't start breathing hard and then you start moving you start moving <laughs> right. and then you start breathing hard right so the cardiovascular system is responding to your movement and it's trying to supply energy for the specific demands that you are uh, you know, that, that you're doing uh, that you're, you're the specific movement demands. So, you know, you need to, to look at what are the, the tension demands. And that's something that really gets skipped over a lot when you're talking about cardio training and people are just trying to train like the heart and the lungs and, and breathe hard and, and train the cardiovascular system without necessarily looking at what are the, the tension demands that I need the cardiovascular system to, uh, to fuel. And so that's one of the, the, the downfalls. Like one of the things that I really try to, you know, emphasize with mountain bikers is that roadside, riding a road bike in, in doing road bike training is not necessarily the best way to train for mountain biking. And, and a lot of riders instinctively kind of run up against this. Like what you run up against is like, 
you know, you always run up against the, the, the question of one, like, you know, uh, better than what. And, and if you're comparing it to better than nothing, then, yeah, it's always going to win. <laughs> and two, yep. you got to look at, like, what are the long term you know, benefits. So if you, if you start riding a road bike and you start seeing some cardiovascular benefits in the first year, well, awesome. And it, you know, you weren't doing anything, you start to see something, but what happens after two or three years? And that's where a lot of people who, who try to use these, you know, high cardio, um, you know, road bike intensive cardio programs to, to try to train for other sports like mountain biking or, or, or you know, moto, you know where they start to fall short is in in the as you start to look at well what are the long term results and the reason for that is you start to run up against the 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 fact that that is not specific to the movement and tension demands that you use in this in, in your sport you know whether you're riding a mountain bike or whether you're riding a motocross bike it's not the same thing as riding a road bike and so you know road biking you know, for for a road cyclist, that is specific physical prep. Like people forget, like runners run and swimmers swim and road cyclists road cycle because that's their sport. You know, like they're not just cardio training, they're practicing their sport when they do that stuff. But we look at these endurance athletes that have this really good cardio and endurance and we think like, oh, they, they you know, they bike a lot and they run a lot and they do all this stuff a lot and they have great endurance. So therefore, we need to do what they're doing in order to get great endurance. And it's like, no, you're confusing the point. Like they do a lot of their sport, right. you know? So like right. you need to look at like, how can I turn my my sport? Like honestly, that's, that's one of the things that people forget is like doing your sports, the number one cardio training that you can do. But a lot of people kind of do it mindlessly and then they separate their cardio training from their, their riding. You know, like I know like mountain bikers are notorious for this. They go for trail rides and they don't really look at them as like, you know, they call them training rides, but they're not necessarily purposefully trying to push a pace that is at or maybe a little bit above where they're comfortable at in their race pace, you know, and, and treating like certain rides as hard rides. Like they just go out and every ride is kind of like the same thing over and over and over. And you can't do that. Like like some rides need to be specifically pushing a pace at or a little bit above your race pace. And, and you may not be able to sustain it for as long as you go out and ride and you have to like kind of treat it like intervals a little bit but then you have moderate rides where you're working more on skills and you're just kind of getting some some miles in and some you know getting some uh you know muscle memory from just doing your sport and then you need recovery rides but i guess it, at the end of the day it's like think about your sport like don't just blindly copy what another sport is doing in order to improve your specific uh, endurance demands for your sport, you know? So, um, that, that's the number one trap that people fall into is not really thinking about, well, what are my movement and tension demands and how can I kind of, you know, use my riding, um, and my sport train, you know, uh, to, to kind of act as cardio training. So, um, hopefully that wasn't too convoluted of an answer, but, uh, um, that's kind of how I look at it. No. Um, and, and again, this kind of is a little bit out of the, the off-road side of things, but w one of the things that I've heard on another show called the Pulp MX Show, uh, recently they've had David Vollerman, um, a past champion, um, past uh, national rider, uh, retired now, but he specifically calls everybody out. He's like, I don't get it. I don't know why people are riding a road bike. And he's like, we don't race road bikes. Um, you know, yeah. He's like, we race dirt bikes. He's like, why aren't they? He's like, when I rode, I rode. I when I went and practiced, I practiced racing. Um, you know, yes. I rode my sport. So, and, and it's interesting because you do see um, everybody. I mean, everybody on a road bike in, in that side of thing. And I think you see that as well with off-road racers. Um, you know, and, and yeah, the supercross, it motocross doesn't make guys a lot of prevalent. sense. So it doesn't I mean, make a lot of sense. Like the the position that you're in is different. Like if you think about it, like like what what again what gets forgotten is like at a certain point you can only take your vo2 max so high you can only stuff so much glycogen in your muscles like that's one of the reasons that people turn to drugs because drugs allow you to push those natural ceilings a little bit higher but again at the end of the day eventually you can't lift more weight you can't push those numbers any higher but people continue to improve and it's, it's because they develop more neurological efficiency. They're able to better utilize what they have rather than trying to always 
put a bigger gas tank into it, they're, they're able to use the gas that they have more efficiently. And so if you realize that and you realize that it, 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 it's going to boil down to neurological efficiency and you understanding the movement and tension demands of your sport and being able to train those things. And again, playing your sport is doing your sport is the, is the number one way to do that and understand how to use that in the context of your entire program is to, instead of trying to look at them as two different things. Then, yeah, it makes it makes no sense why you would hunch over in that ridiculous position on a sub 20 pound bike pedaling your ass off when it has nothing to do with what you actually do in your sport, whether right. you're riding a mountain bike or whether you're on a motocross bike. And I'm not saying like never do it. And if you enjoy it, like do it for fun. That's great. But to like to do it and think that you're really training for the specific demands of, of mountain biking or motocross riding is I, I don't I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. I think there's way better ways to to, to uh, accomplish those things. Right. Now, in a lot of us, you know, the viewers and myself and things like that, you know, we have day jobs. We're not professional racers. We, we fit in what we would call training, which really is just exercise, because um, training is more about long-term goals, where exercising is just to stay at, to a certain shape <laughs> more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, fit. We got to remember, you're a human being first, and that's what training is. That, that, yeah. that, that, that's what you have to make sure that the human being's taken care of so that you can be a better athlete and, and then apply that to your sport. So... So yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. Well, where does where does like we talk about heart rate and you mentioned it too, like heart rate and, and then like we could go on to heart rate monitors and things like that. Like we we've talked a lot about that lately, and it's a big thing was uh, so Coach Sagey that I was telling you about. He is a, he does own a CrossFit box, and I asked him specifically from one of our viewers. He had a question. He's like his uh, the coach at his box tells him he hates heart rate monitors and hates seeing them wear them. Um, we asked him, and he was like, because what does that number tell you about the wad that you just did? And in reality, it tells you absolutely nothing. He says he used, and so Coach was telling um, uh, us, you know, he uses them on his riders like Andrew Short and Jason Anderson mainly to track recovery. Um, you know, it, so that way he knows maybe if he can, he can has just enough stuff documented that he can kind of tell when they're getting sick, when they've trained too much, or maybe when they have right. the ability to train more than they normally would because of wherever they're at. So you, if you could give us a little bit of your thought process on heart rate monitors and maybe how to and how not to use them. Sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know both. Um, you know, both answers that you gave are correct, and that you have to understand like what the numbers are telling you. Okay. And people can definitely overuse it, and so. If you're using them for a training purpose, you want to use it in a reproducible workout. So if you're using a training system like CrossFit that has a pretty high degree of randomness to it, then your heart rate numbers from one wad to the next aren't going to mean much. And you know, but if you have a uh, a cardio program that 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 has some sort of systematic progression and a and, and continuity. And you can see how your heart rate is responding. Like if you start out with, you know, uh, 10 seconds of work and 50 seconds rest and you uh, systematically work yourself to where you're doing like 20 seconds of work and 30 seconds of rest and you see how your heart rate's responding through that progression, then you can see that like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm progressing or I'm, you know, not or, or kind of get an idea of, of how things are looking for that. So. You know, that's if you're going to use it for training purposes, you definitely need some uh, a program that has a little more continuity. If you're just kind of, you know, too much variety won't work. As far as like from a recovery standpoint, yeah, there's definitely a lot of, uh, um, you know, research and, and, you know, just kind of uh, real world evidence that shows that, you know, your, your resting heart rate. I'm not exactly sure how he was using it to track the recovery, but traditionally, like tracking your, your morning resting heart rate. Is, uh, is a really good way to kind of see how your um, overall recovery is and you'll start to see patterns and you know when it's lower you'll you'll know that you're you know generally recovering better if you see a, an elevated heart rate compared to your usual heart rate so for example if you're you know usually at like a little under 60 uh, beats per minute and you see it elevated a, a little over 60 beats per minute then you know then your system's a little stressed, and if you see that for a couple of days in a row, then you know, like, okay, I'm not quite recovering as well as I could 
um, from your workouts. And, you know, if you really wanted to get into it, they've got a whole other realm, you know, heart rate variability training that, uh, that you can use. And, and I, I actually use that for um, over a year. And, and I, I really learned a lot from that. The main thing I learned from it was how to really listen to my body. Like after a while, I didn't need the HRV as much because I had just gotten so in tune with like how my body was feeling and what the numbers were telling me that I kind of learned a better way to train by feel. And they always talk about training by feel, but the hardest thing is like getting that objective number to begin with to give you permission to not kick your ass every time you go in the gym. You know, like some days a light day or, or, or a moderate day is fine. And, uh, you know, um, so, so yeah, no, I mean, using heart rate definitely has a place, but where people go wrong is they start to drive their training. Like, remember, like what I was talking about, like, it boils down to efficiency. Another, another point of efficiency is, is, uh, breathing and your posture. And a lot of times people will blow past those two things in order to try to work on achieving and maintaining a certain heart rate or in mountain biking and road cycling, uh, power readings are another uh, thing, you know, that, that, that gets uh, um, numbers that get chased a lot. And so if, if, you're, if you're hitting those numbers and you have good breathing patterns and you are maintaining good posture, then fine. But if you're just, if you're not paying attention to those two things first and you're just like worried about your heart rate, then you know you're 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 putting the car before the horse because right. really if you're not breathing efficiently like you know what the hell are you training your bad breathing <laughs> patterns like right. you know it, it, people talk about like vo2 max and blah 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 and it's like but look at you you can't breathe for crap you know you breathe through your mouth and through, you use your chest you don't understand how to use your diaphragm and 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 you know just all of these these basic things that people don't even think about and like honestly the most powerful training tip that you could ever do is learn how to breathe properly. Like if, if you do that, like you will be amazed at what that will do for your cardio and just, you know, your movement and everything else that you, that you want. So well, I know that but, that would be like uh, probably a whole show of its own. So uh, just on that note though, do you have anything written um, uh, like a blog post or anything like that on your site that we would be able yeah. to go and read? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Kind of specific to that breathing part. Yeah, I mean, if I, I'm sure I've got uh, uh, so much stuff there. If you if you just do a search at my bikejames.com website for breathing, um, you're gonna find a bunch of stuff that I've done on you know breathing tips, you know posture, same thing. You know, just do a search for posture. I mean, those are those are two things that I'm very big on because again, if you don't understand how those things apply to what you're trying to accomplish in your sport, then Man, you're just spinning your wheels and training. I mean, you know, every time that you do a deadlift, a deadlift is not just an exercise. It's a chance for you to practice a specific movement pattern and posture and breathing pattern. And and you, you want to understand, like, that's that's how you want to you want to move. I mean, it's, you know, you, you don't even want your body to understand what a bad rep feels like because when you get tired, your body is going to fall back on what it knows. And so – you know, if all you've trained is good breathing and good habits and good posture, you're going to see that. And you see that in the best. Like, this is one of those things that, like, the best naturally do. You watch the best in any sport. You can tell they're pinning it. They're going so freaking fast, but they don't look like they're working hard. You know, you know they're working hard, but they don't look like they're working really hard. They're not on the ragged edge of their abilities. There's, like, a smoothness and a control that you're just like, man, that's awesome, you know. Like, that's just – you know, they're able, and, and as they get tired, like they just, they maintain it. They, they, their first, their last lap looks like their first lap, you know, and, and that's what you want to train yourself to be able to achieve. And so like, you know, that's that, that control and efficiency is really what it's all about. Not just training yourself to freaking live on the ragged edge of, uh, of control. Yeah, so of form and function, um, I think one of the things that I've I've had some issues with lately, and I wanted to see what you thought about this is, and I did, we did talk to Coach Sagey about two weeks ago on this exact uh, exact subject was uh, trying not to train to wreck in the sense that I find that I have a lot of issues where if I make a quick mistake or you know to, if if shit just gets really south and I've got to pick myself and the bike up off the ground at that point, not only one am I like oh shit I got to do this, so I'm just already 
freaking myself out mentally, but then my heart rate's up because i got to physically pick the bike up. Who knows what position I'm in. It could be heavier. i got to get really funky with it to get it up. And get back on the bike, and you try to uh, attack at that point. I mean, I'm blown out. Like, I just have nothing left right there, and I feel like I have to kind of cut it back to like 60%, give myself a couple minutes to really, uh, you know, essentially recover to get, yep. and then be able to push again. So how do I – how do I – what are good ways to train to kind of be able to have those quick mistakes maybe and not have them affect you or affect me so much? Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, that's a, that's a great question. And you know, there's two, there's two parts to that. One, there's definitely a mental aspect, you know, I mean, there's, there's this, uh, there's definitely a stress factor going on that's causing that heightened, physical response and so you know uh, whatever that is like the, there's just i mean basic mental training 101 is understand your your uh basic thinking habits when presented with a situation think about well what's a better way that i can think about this and then consciously inject that better way of thinking about it next time you're presented with that situation Okay. You know, so like if you're on the ground and you're thinking, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, you know, and you realize like, okay, that's not constructive at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I could probably start to think about, okay, you know, I need to find out, okay, I got to get my, my base under me and get my bike up. You know, I just, I need to get my bike up, just get my bike up and, and go from there. Okay. That, that's a better thing than just sitting there thinking, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. Okay. So like next time you're presented with the situation, you start to think, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. You got to think, oh, what? Ah, 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 okay, deep breath. All right, get my bike up. Let's go from there. So, you know, what, whatever that is, that, that's a pretty simplistic example of what I'm talking about. But that's, again, that that's mental training 101 is understanding what your loops are uh, and, and, and what's a better way to think about it and then consciously breaking the loop and injecting that better way to think about it in that situation. So, if you can do that, that will go a long way towards, you know, keeping the, the physical response under control. And the other thing is, and this is something that people really uh, forget, is that the ability to relax is just as important as your ability to work hard. And in fact, there's a, uh, um, I'm famous for quoting studies that I've heard from other people that I don't necessarily know the, <laughs> the numbers and stuff for. You're famous for quoting smart, so anyway. smarter people than us? Exactly. Point is, <laughs> okay. the, the, the Soviets took a look at like what was the difference between their Olympic level sprinters and their national level sprinters, the guys that were just below them. And what they found was that the Olympic level guys weren't necessarily creating more muscular force. They were able to relax more completely between, uh, between um, leg strides. You know, So when presented with the opportunity to relax, they were able to relax more completely so that their next their next muscular contraction, even though it technically wasn't more forceful, uh, was more forceful because the muscles were more relaxed to begin with. So the point is, is like the ability to relax is very important. So when you train, people look at rest as this four-letter word. It's like, man, when I'm resting, it's like that is the freaking the crap time between the fun stuff that I gotta like just kind of get through. And people are always looking like, well, how do I cut back on the rest time? How do I like? you know, superset this with this. So I have as little rest as possible. And it's like, man, the rest time is just as valuable as the work time. Training yourself to, to, uh, to relax, to get your heart rate down as quickly as possible, to be able to lower your tension levels. Those are extremely valuable tools for you to have, to be able to call upon when you're put in a stressful situation and you have to like, all right, I got to like get, it back under control because what's your that that's the thing like you have to get those things back under control before you your cardio like your cardio is busy supporting the stress and tension of you being mentally stressed out and the tension of you just kind of being like you know the stress reaction of being tight you know and if you've trained yourself to one have a better mental reaction and two have a better just have the ability to relax right relax. Oh, okay. You know, and you have those two things. Those two things will help you in pretty much any kind of like, you know, stress response situation, but particularly what you're, uh, what you're talking about. But that, that would be my, 
my take on it. I think it's good advice. I uh, I remember uh, I was having a lot of problems with just a lot of weird shit, just anxiety, not sleeping well, all that kind of stuff. And then obviously a lot of little things that I could work on. But the one thing that I realized that helped me the most was learning how to fall asleep. And I know that sounds stupid, but I was taking a lot, a lot of drugs to sleep. And But I still wasn't sleeping well. I was just asleep i wasn't awake i guess you could say i wasn't actually resting but once i've once i've figured out how to kind of like wind down at night and go to sleep and get restful sleep man that changed it that made a huge difference in my anxiety how i woke up in the morning how like how well my day went all kinds of fun stuff um so it, it's interesting that you say learning how to relax in between some of the work is so important when that's what sleep is like that is the ultimate relaxation um, yeah. is that rest time there. So that's cool. Well, man, that was, uh, that was, that was a lot of information. I know that I'm going to wind up, uh, listening to this quite a few times just so one, I can realize all the mistakes I made when I was talking and two, that way I can kind of try to, uh, pick up on a lot more of the fun information that you were, that you were given to us. So I know we didn't talk about it too much though, but your website is bikejames.com. Is that correct? Yep. That's it. Yeah. I can, uh, anybody can find out more about me there if you do any sort of mountain biking or road cycling i will tell you this you don't need those clipless pedals everything that they tell you about them well at least 90 percent of it is a lie or a myth and uh you don't so you can check out it's called the uh um the flat pedal rider uh flat pedal revolution manifesto you can find it on my site but it's got all of the the info that you need to let you know that riding flat pedals like we did when we were kids just ripping around on our BMX bikes is not only perfectly fine, but uh, you can do everything on them that you can with clipless pedals. And, uh, man, and attaching your feet to those pedals is actually not such a hot idea. So if you are using mountain biking or road cycling as a cross-training tool, um, be sure and check that out because those clipless pedals will mess you up and you don't need them. Yeah, interesting. I'm gonna go read it because I've been running clippers for a long time, and yeah, I, that yeah, just that's what it was. So I'm gonna go read that for sure, and uh, figure out what I may or may not be doing right. But I do still dirt jump and uh, downhill with flats because there you go. My ass needs to bail quick <laughs> when I when I make mistakes on a downhill run or uh, or on a dirt jumping because I suck at all by both of them. So. You know, yep. I gotta ditch that, ditch that bike quick. Well, dude, we really appreciate your time. Uh, it's not that we want to cut it short. It's just that we just we love the fact that we don't. We, we kind of pride ourselves on not having the longest show out there. Some of these guys oh, put man, up I... like four hours, and that's just ridiculous. So, um, keep it going, though. We know that there's a lot of stuff in your world that you spend a lot of time dealing with that could help us out. Um, we, if if you're ever out there, you're working with another moto guy, or you're working with you know some of your world your World Cup athletes. And you think of something, hey, man, this could really help the guys over at Sea Time and their viewers. Let us know. Reach back out. We'd love to have you back on and be able to, to you know, keep the discussions going. I think we all get better when we get to, to talk about this kind of stuff. So Yeah, for sure. Likewise, you ever got any uh, topics you want my opinion on, feel free to let me know. I, I got no problem in filling half an hour. Dig it. Strip clubs. That's going to be our next talk. All right. There you go. Yes. Wait, do you Do you live in Colorado, right? Yes, I do. Where, where you don't have to give me your exact address, but what about city? No, you don't want the, you don't want the GPS coordinates. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I in, do. <laughs> <laughs> I live in a Grand Junction. Okay, yeah, uh, that's Mount the, super west. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about uh, man, about like an hour from Moab, a little over an hour from Moab, like twenty miles from the Utah border. So very um, jealous. Yeah, it's awesome. Like here's the high desert, man. Got awesome trails around here, and then a couple hour drive, and you're in the in the mountains. So got the best of both worlds. Oh, oh, we did have a question uh, from the chat room, just asking what your website was, and I had it right, bikejames.com. Yep, that's it, bikejames.com. Okay, cool. Grand Junction later this year is going to have a national enduro. Um, so. Um, I might try to get you some of that information and then as well uh, try to get some of those guys might uh, be able to stop by. I know a lot of people are going to be traveling to that race just because of the fact that not many of us live in Colorado. Um, and I'm trying to yeah. see if my dad and I can travel out there. If we do, for sure, I'm going to stop by, see your facility, uh, be able to meet you in person. Um, but if nothing else, I'll make sure any of the guys I talk to go into that event that I can pass them over to you. Um, and hopefully you guys can meet up and uh, you can check out what we do a little bit and maybe uh, give some more pointers in person. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. 
Heck yeah, dude. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And uh, go enjoy a pint full of awesome. Do something cool and make sure you high five us virtually, all right? All right, Brian. Sounds good, man. <laughs> appreciate the time. Thanks again, James. Take it easy. All right, buddy. See ya. Later. All right. Yeah. So our second guest is uh, Mr. James Wilson. You can check him out at bikejames.com. Super, super cool dude. Um, he will. He does live in Grand Junction, so if you guys are making it to that National Enduro uh, the, later this year, you can head over there and check him out. Um, I, I – I would imagine if we could get enough people to have interest that he could probably um, head over to the race site on Saturday and maybe talk to some people in person. Um, I think a lot of us ride mountain bikes. I, I talk to my wife about this a lot. Just because of the fact that we have the ability to run doesn't mean that we know how to run correctly. Who who taught us how to run? Um, and and, and it's, it's an interesting way to think because our body was made to function a certain way, uh, the mechanics of it. But do we know that we're doing that correctly? Okay, yeah, sure, that can get spacey. People can think about it, all that kinds of stuff. Well, it's the same thing in these mountain biking situations and a lot of the other stuff that we do. There's people in this world that spend their life learning how to make sure that we do all these functions correctly. Um, and with that, I think that there's a chance to learn um, a little bit from these people. Now, we're not going to go out and become scientists because of it, but that's their that's their job. Hopefully, we can just become better athletes and, and better humans um, and a little bit healthier um, and uh make our life and journey up to 80 years just a little bit more enjoyable as we try to get there. Um, so we're trying to get connected with our third guest. I know uh, Mr. Mark is going to be coming on here soon. Um, big shout out to another sponsor and supporter of Seat Time is the guys over at Fast Company. Um, can't thank them enough. So if you guys don't know who Fast Company is, you definitely need to go check them out. Fastco.com. Obviously somebody is listening to the show at the same time as they're getting called in right now. But so, Fast Company, you can check them out, fastcode.com. Um, they actually just uh, partnered up with Ryan Sipes. So, they're going to be running, he's going to be running Flex Bars uh, at GNCC this year. So, that's cool that they picked him up. Um, if you've ever been suffering from arm pump, hand numbness, tingling, or any kind of tendonitis, they're definitely um, something that you need to look into. Um, I obviously had my shoulder surgery in April. I am now running Flex Bars, and they are fantastic. They are they have, they help my shoulders so much. I do still wear the brace and all that kinds of stuff just for security in case I hit the ground. But uh, the soreness that I was so afraid of um, coming back from that surgery is just not there. Um, and and it, I'm thankful to those guys for reaching out to me and for the discussions we had on ergonomics, on setup. Um, what's so neat, too, is you're like, oh, I just bought these guys bars. I'm never going to talk to them again. That's not true at all. You can call them. You can get their cell numbers. You can be out at the track, and you're like, man, I just think this, that, the other. And they're going to talk to you about the ergonomics. They're going to talk to you about the settings, and they're going to make sure that you're happy and set up uh, and ready to go. So definitely, you can check them out at fastco.com is the website. Or if you happen to need their phone number, I have it written down right here, 877-306-1801. Um, the guys at Fast Company are fantastic dudes. We got to ride with them. Yeah, please go check them out. They're fantastic guys, and we cannot uh, say thank you enough for them for supporting Seat Time. So now we have our third guest. We are connected. Mr. Mark, I want you to first off pronounce your last name because I know I keep screwing it up. It's Korea. Korea. So well, co not in, in like Japan, Korea. <laughs> yeah. In Japan, it would be Korea. Korea. But we could, yeah, I could see me screwing that up a lot. Okay, so Mark Korea, we have you on the show tonight. Um, I, it's funny. I was looking at your pictures, and I was like, I don't know why I never had this, this epiphany before, but I was like, this guy needs to be on the show. He's in the West Coast. He's at all of these races. He's taking all of these pictures, writing all these race reports. He's the guy to talk to to get the greatest you know, information from the West Coast. So... I'm so thankful that you came on the show this evening. I want to tell you, you look very dapper. Thank you. Uh, I re accepted this uh, as a responsibility to you and as a sign of respect. Nice. Well, you're the first person ever that respects me enough to put on that kind of, the, to, to get that dapper. And I really appreciate it. I don't even think I have a tie that, that's, that is that sexy. Is that a what, – what, what, what's the pattern on your tie there? Old motorcycles. Hey, see, classy on all levels, and that's the way it should be. We really, really appreciate you being on the show. So, what have you been up to recently? You could tell us media stuff, you could tell us motorcycle stuff, or you could just talk about last night at the bar. I didn't go to the bar last night. Oh, okay. 
I, I, at least I don't remember going to a bar last night. <laughs> if you did, it must have been a good time because you forgot. Yeah. It. Uh, mostly, I've just been writing out race reports from the the Hare and Hound this past weekend up in uh, Red Mountain. Nice. So you were there at the National Hare and Hound for uh, round one uh, when Ivan Ramirez got his first win. You were there this weekend uh, when Nick got his win uh, for uh, 2014, his first win now. Um, and Ivan Ramirez was in second. Um, Jacob, Jacob's bike broke down at this round, so he hasn't been having that good of luck. I kind of wanted your thoughts on the 2014 series uh, season so far. I mean, I know it's only two rounds and we've got a lot more to go, but are things what you expected them to be? Um, are they not what you expected them to be? Kind of give us your take on, on, on everything that's been going on out there. I, I did come into the season expecting that it would be a lot more competitive this year. Uh, I I knew that Ivan would be strong, and I figured Jake would be right up there. Uh, Nick and Justin Morrow would be other players, and so far they've proven me right. Uh, I didn't know that Ricky Brabeck was going to be running the series this year, and so he's been a, a pleasant surprise to see come into the series and be one of the top guys right away. Yeah. Um, do, could you uh, give us a little bit uh, – I. I know for round one, Jacob Argobright had some issues uh, with bike trouble. Uh, and again, it sounded like for round two, he actually had some bike trouble. Being on the, uh, there kind of in the desert with everybody, do you have a little bit more information on specifics on kind of maybe what were the issues with the round one and then what were the issues this past weekend? I think at round one, it was a uh, fuel line issue. Okay. And, and Sunday, it was some catastrophic motor failure apparently Ugh. he said it, it kind of clattered and then stopped so that's usually not a good sign no that's yeah that's that's you walking back to the pits and if you can find neutral then you at least you could push the bike <laughs> yeah. um with that do you i mean it seems to me uh with the everything with husqvarna has moved very quickly um with the the problems that we've seen Jacob having do you think that it's just the bike and the rider and the whole situation maybe coming into the Heron Hounds too quickly and not prepared enough or are we still just kind of uh, you know two things two mechanicals it can happen to anybody I I think that it's just been bad luck uh, from what I understand the bike is basically the same as what Kurt Casale ran last year so it's a proven design, and it's just got a, a few updates, like the, the Palmer subframe. And so I, I think it's just been just really bad luck on his part. Yeah. Um, and, the, and in the desert racers, I, I have not, unfortunately, had a chance to do a lot of, of real desert racing. Here in Texas, we can get West Texas, and they're more desert-y, a lot more sand. But in those situations, what what kind of preparations do riders need to take um, that that could wind up causing maybe issues like uh, blowing up a bike? You know, I don't know if there's you know, does it is it air boot situation where you could wind up sucking in dirt um, differently? What are some of the things that riders need to you know be more cautious about when prepping for such a, a desert type race? The desert is completely different, of course, than uh, GNCC. Uh, naturally, you have to prep the bike very thoroughly and it's just done with a few different things uh, so what well, you don't have to run hand guards especially because you're not going to be threading through trees <laughs> yeah. but there's a, a lot of stuff out in the desert that'll bite you and the bike uh, so guys tend to run bigger skid plates and Unfortunately, still, there are rocks that will rip off shifters and brake pedals, as we've seen the first two rounds. Yeah. Um, the, the gearing has to be usually uh, account for a wider variety of speeds because some of those canyons and downhills, they'll be first gear just walking, and then they'll be in a valley that's just wide open in top gear, 80, 90, 100 miles an hour. That's crazy. And with that, is that something that a rider could easily just change sprockets to get there? Or is, do you think that that's typically like a transmission thing to, uh, to get that a little bit wider or narrower uh, the, the gear ratio? I think for the, the average guy, 
of the wide ratio gearbox is a good idea. Okay. The top guys tend to favor the close ratio uh, gearboxes that are found in the motocross bikes. Right. And right. they're talented enough to be able to carry enough speed <laughs> yeah. that, that a little bit of clutch flipping isn't going to really hurt the, the bike at all. Right. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, we kind of – you have been a photographer in not just the off-road uh, world for a long time, but you've been – taking pictures of dirt bikes and motorcycles for a very, very long time. Um, w- what kind of got you started in this line of work? I've never been able, you know, we've met a handful of times throughout the past couple of years, but that's a conversation I've never been able to actually have with you. And I think it'd be quite interesting for a lot of people out there that kind of might see this, you know, what you do as a possible career for themselves. It goes back a long time. Uh, when I was in grade school, they asked us, what would you like to be when you grow up? And I, gee, I don't know. That's, that's you're you're pretty young. You know that? I don't, I don't care. <laughs> yep. I, said, I think I'd like to be a photographer. So they said, fine. And I didn't really think much of it. I I took a couple of photography classes in high school and college. I worked on the school paper, and I ended up getting my degree in uh, journalism. Uh, so it kind of pointed me in the right direction, and I thought I would just use my education to get a, a job with a, a daily paper or something and son of a gun wouldn't you know it after gosh my junior year a friend of mine had a, a friend who was gonna be going to the hospital so she was covering the uh, CMC motocross series at Carlsbad and Saddleback every Sunday and she said hey can you take over this beat while I uh, recover from my surgery? That's sure. And it was with the understanding that uh, she would come back and cover the races after she was done and healed. So I said, sure, no problem. And so I did that for the summer. And she decided that she liked her weekends off so much. She said, keep on doing it, and you're doing a great job. So <laughs> I said, OK. I, I kept on freelancing for Cycle News and covering Saddleback and Carlsbad CMC motocross. Saw Stu Peters every Sunday and Sandra and the whole gang. And let's see, after I graduated college, I worked for a year as a customer service rep for the Vivitar camera company. And that was okay. It wasn't really, really wanted to do. Yeah. So, and then I, was, I still kept freelancing on the weekends. And so after a year of doing that, uh, Charlie Morey, the editor at Cycle News West at the time, called me up and said, hey, you want a job? <laughs> I thought about it for a little bit. I thought, okay, yeah, this sounds like fun. So I got a job as a staff editor at Cycle News in Signal Hill, California, and that was my introduction to the industry, and I've been here ever since. Nice. And uh, now, are you kind of, uh, do you kind of contract or freelance for I guess all the different kind of magazines and organizations out there, or do you still work specifically for Cycle News and then just do uh, small offshoots every now and again? No, I'm a, a freelancer and I have been since '96. Okay, so for a while, yeah. wow. Yeah, so I Cycle News, um, Dirt Rider, Dirt Bike, uh, some of the websites like offroad.com, digitaloffroad.com, for offroad.com, yeah. and uh, even some foreign publications too. Oh, that's cool. Well, yeah. um, in the freelance world, I know it's it's tough. Uh, this isn't a huge industry. I know, like the more and more we get into it, the more I guess the more enthused we are about this industry, the bigger we kind of think it is, and the more people would think that it's very interesting. But I think the more you get into it and realize that you're trying to make money within this industry, that you start to find out how small it really is. Um, so, as a freelancer, and maybe somebody coming up trying to trying to say, you know what? I'm taking good pictures. These are pictures that I think are magazine worthy or maybe at least web worthy, you know, to, to be up there with a story, things like that. Do you, what do you think are some of the best routes for them to maybe try to, to get in a chance to start showcasing their stuff within a website or within, you know, a, a publication? The good thing about uh, the internet is that there are a number of websites now that seem to be dedicated to providing even just local race coverage, not not the super nationals or anything or international races, but yeah, so there are opportunities, I think, for getting your work um, out 
into the general public. So that's kind of nice. Okay. The only problem is that they usually don't pay a whole lot. So, yeah. But yeah, you got to pay your dues sometime, I guess. So for sure. And uh, do you? Find, I noticed that you and Shan Moore both do a lot of copywriting for the stories that you do, uh, along with a lot of the photography that you do. But you see somebody like a Simon Cudby. He's kind of just a photographer. Um, is is it just the what he does and and who he does it for that maybe uh, that he doesn't have to kind of do copywriting as well, or do you do you kind of have a is there is there anything to that, or just kind of like the way that it worked out? Simon is one of the the gifted photographers in the industry for sure, and uh, there are only a handful of guys who can make it uh, as a dirt bike photographer. Uh, today, and he's one of them. Uh, Garth Mylan is another. Um, there's there's a few. Right. Drew Ruiz. Uh, I don't think I'm at that level. So plus, I don't want to do just one thing exclusively. Okay. I I think I would get burned out trying to be that creative behind the camera all the time. So I kind of enjoy uh, having the break and doing actual writing. Uh, to balance out, so I do like a fifty-fifty mix. Cool. Yeah, I, I have uh, I, I've started to to try to kind of do a little bit more writing. I've always enjoyed it, and it, and it was something I didn't realize I did enjoy. It wasn't until I had to start writing press releases for Seat Time to kind of try to get more awareness for shows and things like that. So I started doing that, and then I would start doing little reviews and stuff. I was like, huh, this is kind of fun. Um, and now I, I thoroughly enjoy it. It's it's interesting to sit down and really. Uh, and now it's to the point now where a lot of the stuff that I write that I, I feel is of merit, you know, I, I'll spend a week or two on it. Uh, I don't just, you know, write it in a, um, uh, a day or two, you know, and it's, it's interesting to try to, to think that now I would put that much effort into just a piece of writing, you know, like, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, of all the stuff that you've covered, what are some of the biggest highlights? What is something that just, that sticks out in your mind so much that you're always going to remember that's just such a magical moment of all the stuff you've done. Boy, there, there, there are so many great opportunities that I've, I've had over the years. It's hard to pick just one. I, I know that my favorite race each year is the ISDE because it's held in a different country every year. And so I get to travel to different places and the race is six days long, plus the before and after. So it gives me a chance to get out and see the countryside and shoot more locations and develop a more of a closer relationship with the riders and other people involved. Yeah. And then there's been some of the trail rides I've been able to go on in the past as well. Um, gosh, Costa Rica has always been one of my favorite places to ride. And I've been lucky to be there a few times. Uh, Australia has, was awesome to, to visit. Oh, and, I bet. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was able to be guest editor at Australasian Dirt Bike years ago. And so I spent a little over three months one summer over there. And I always say it's the best three months of my life. As I got to live in Australia, got to work there. Got to ride bikes, got to test bikes, got to shoot bikes, and even got to race a little bit. So I'll always remember the one enduro race I did there. It was on a an X six days XR two fifty that a guy loaned me. So it was a little bit hammered, right. but it was, <laughs> it was two wheels. It ran, and I thought I was stoked. So went out, and I was shocked because the place where it was held at was out in the bush somewhere. It was probably like a six hour drive from Sydney. And I remember going out earlier in the morning, getting out there just in time to sign up and get my gear on and everything. And it was a, a two-loop race. So I'm, the first loop, we were just kind of cruising and looking at the tests. And I remember, this place is a lot like Gorman, except for the eucalyptus trees, but the same kind of dry, rocky dirt and up and down hills and stuff. But then as I looked off to my side, in this one test, I noticed a kangaroo hopping beside me. So, <laughs> yeah, this is Gorman. Yeah, this is definitely Australia. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I got to do, you know, I think it was one of the first times that we met was at the ISDE there in Germany. 
Um, and that was such an amazing experience. Um, I know that there are there are many riders just like myself that wish that you know we could find that extra special sauce, whatever it is, to be able to qualify for a club team and be able to race uh, for you know for the USA over, you know, at any ISDE, let alone just the one in Germany. But uh, you know if if that doesn't ever work out for me, that's okay. I know now, and I would definitely encourage a lot of other people to kind of do what I did. Um, I I went and helped out Jason Hooper. Um, I paid my own way, just figured it out, and I did a bunch of media stuff. In this case, it was for seat time. It was cool. It was a way to, to kind of get in, but I paid for everything um, and didn't have any media sponsors, unfortunately. It was just what it was, but I had the, rest, the best time. It was the coolest way to see that event. Um, it's tough because I can even imagine for when you're there and it is your job job, you have to get the shots. You have to get the stories. So you have to get out to all the locations, and I was doing that because I was with Hooper and with Shan, um, but man... It, you get to see so much as you're saying you get to travel all over the place and i really want to be able to take my wife to argentina this year um and, and granted in the sense that you know we go early or stay late so she doesn't have to be around for all of six days because i know she would get kind of bored on a lot of that stuff but um yeah i'm really i really think that a lot of people should put more effort into if you don't qualify try to go anyway um, and try to find your own adventure and your own story there, regardless of the fact of qualifying and racing or not, because it was such a magical experience for me. And I, I would, I very much look forward to trying to to get another credit card and maxing it out so that I can uh, so that I can go again, because it's damn expensive. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think about Argentina? Um, about the the ISDE coming up this year? Are you? I, I would imagine you're going to be there. You've been to quite a few of the past ones. Yeah, I'm planning on going, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and my, my credit card will be maxed out too, because <laughs> yeah. that's the one of the trips that I have to pay for myself. So, uh, I was at the presentation that Argentina put on last year, and they showed quite a, a video, and it looks like it'll be kind of similar to the terrain that we found in Sardinia, Italy this mm -hmm. past year. It's going to be dry and rocky. Uh, pretty hilly, and so I think that will kind of favor the West Coast guys again. Huh. Okay, and that'll be cool. I mean, we got you know Taylor Roberts been doing really really well. Um, you know, Mike Brown always really well. I don't I don't know though. I mean, if he's gonna, I mean, you know, he's always anxious to do it, but I, I just don't know as he's kind of getting older and probably wanting to spend a little more time with his family. Um, and it sounds like he's going to be living back in Tennessee a little bit more opposed to being in California so much if he's yeah. going to be on the team. Um, but, you know, guys like Charlie Mullins did so well, or has done so well the past two years. Uh, Kurt Russell, uh, Caleb Russell, Kurt Russell, that guy's a, that's an actor. Uh, <laughs> Caleb Russell did so well. Um, and then, like, Zach Osborne, is he going to come back? How's he going to do? Ryan Sipes was on the club team, did so well. Um, you know, it, it'd be interesting. And I think that those guys have so much more of a – they have such a different dynamic – to their riding style that uh, it could really be a big help so w one thing i wanted to ask that it was tough because it was talking to ivan and talking to a couple other people it, it, you don't want to don't want to dwell too much and so this isn't a dwell question when it comes to kurt caselli but i have to ask in the sense of being at those rounds with the national hair and how event how hair and hound events how, how does it feel Did, is there the notice the lack of a kurt caselli um, in the air at, at the events? I think so. Uh, Kurt was just a, such a strong personality that he touched so many lives at the races and it's it's gonna be impossible to fill those shoes so uh, yeah we, we all miss Kurt and what he accomplished and what he was as a person most of all. Yeah yeah and, 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 and in reality he may not have been at any of the hair and hounds this year. You know, he may have been, you know, once he signed that, uh, that KTM Europe contract for the rallies, you know, he may not have been able to do that at all. So it may have been kind of, it's just obviously, you know, situational is where a lot of the, the feelings and the emotions come up about the situation. So I had to ask, and I just kind of wanted to know, you know, it's unfortunate because of the fact that being in Texas, you know, we don't get to the East coast a ton, nor do we get to the West coast a ton. So that's why I love to talk to guys like you, um, and it, I, I almost feel like I should apologize for the fact that I haven't asked you to come on before because you always do have such great knowledge and you're always involved in the uh, in the scene over there. Um, so 
Zach Huberty has been giving us some fun questions, what I'm calling the I.O. questions for Innovation Off-Road. And one of the ones that he sent over that I thought was hilarious that I had to ask you is that what rider seems to give you the worst roost? Hmm. <laughs> Boy, I try to position myself so where I don't get roosted. <laughs> so you're saying that a good photographer is a smart photographer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those cameras are really expensive to fix. Yes. Oh gosh. Are there now? Here's kind of a dumb, ignorant question of just not being uh, into the accessories, probably like you are. Is there some form of lens cover or, I guess, almost a filter? Could you put like an ND filter that's not as expensive as an entire lens to kind of like be a be a cover? I always run a a, a filter on my lenses. It's usually, a, I think it's a Skylight 1B or something, so it's a little bit warmer than a neutral filter, and it doesn't require any exposure compensation. So it just adds a little bit of layer of protection. Um, I remember years ago, I was shooting one of the half miles at Ascot, and all of a sudden, I noticed everything got really f fuzzy. So I looked down at my lens, the front of my lens, and some one of the bikes had kicked up a, a rock or a bolt or something. And it actually broke my filter. Oh. So I was real thankful that I had it on to save the front element of the lens. Yeah. <laughs> Man, speaking of rocks, what did you think of Corey Grafunda and his uh, his JB Weld job at the King of the Motos? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> that that true perseverance you he wanted to finish yeah that's why you see cross country and off-road guys wear tool belts mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> those are the guys that want to finish regardless of the fact of what happens in the woods they don't feel like pushing it back to their motorhome <laughs> yeah. well cool okay well what were some situ what are some publications and things like that where people can see some of your your upcoming work and uh, do you have a, a current website that you kind of keep updated or does a lot of your stuff just go straight to the publications that you're working for? I wish I had a website but uh, I've never had the time to get one built or anything so I just send all my stuff to the different media outlets uh, like Cycling was of course, Dirt Rider, Dirt Bike, uh, some stuff for RacerX, uh, offroad.com, digitaloffroad.com, Verb Offroad, um, uh, the, the AMA Magazine, I'm, I'm doing a a story for them right now on uh, see Riley Ellinger and Megan Blackburn that is going to be in like part of their women in off-road series. Cool. Well, that'll be really neat to read. I look, I, I get that magazine. I'm a 24-year AMA member, so you wouldn't think Oops. that considering the fact that I'm 32 years old. But my dad got me. I think I, I guess I don't know. I could do the math, but I'm not. I, probably like eight, seven. So when I first started, you know, going to the little peewee races with my dad uh, at the little mini stuff. So there we go. 25 years. I'm almost a lifer. One more year. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I get the magazines. I read them. They're, they're good stuff. I think it's going to be neat, uh, too, now that the GNCC is AMA sanctioned again. Um, that we're gonna, that in, And one of their missions is to kind of bring in a little bit more off-road to their magazine so it doesn't feel so on-road associated. Um, and I think that that'll be, that'll be good. And you've seen that. Um, but a little bit more race related, I think, too, will help kind of spice up the content just a hair. I don't know. Maybe you should write a maybe you should write an article on me. <laughs> that would be pretty uh, pretty pretty off the cuff. <laughs> and actually, I think the AMA does a, a racer specific uh, magazine. I think I believe it's called AMA Racer. Okay. Yeah, so maybe. it concentrates mostly on the, the competition end of things. Okay, that's definitely not me. I mean, I race, but I'm I'm definitely not worthy enough to be in a racer magazine <laughs> by any means. If I if, if I race into the beer tent, maybe, <laughs> maybe I might win. But you something. can read about it. Yeah, that's totally worth reading about, though, for sure. <laughs> Dig it. Well, cool. Well, I uh, one, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to come on the show, um, and I apologize for not having you on sooner. Uh, it's a total slight on my part for just. So unfortunately, uh, having no memory whatsoever. But uh, so, go ahead. I'm so hurt. Yeah, I know. I know. After after all of our uh, our mini our mini trips together, you'd think that I would think better about it, but no. Yeah. Um, and as well for getting dressed up, I you are the first guest that has ever really like completely stepped it up a notch. And uh, Cody Webb was one of the ones. I think he had a wig and a fun hat 
and of course his pearly white teeth as he always does you can't get away from those but uh that, that was probably the closest we've had to being dressed up but i have to say you've you've stepped it up to a whole nother level so our guests are going to have to really figure it out to uh to, to surpass what you have brought to the table so before we go though what are tips on having awesome hair because i mean i'm working on it i'm getting there but i'm not to a korea level yet so help me out what do i need to do i use the cheapest stuff out there <laughs> <laughs> it's like man i sell pictures i need the, the cheap shit <laughs> <laughs> 99 cent only store the dollar store. They don't tell you that that's actually uh, just from the bottom of the barrel of the super expensive stuff. So in reality, it's the same thing. Right. Dig it. That's smart. That's smart. I'll have to stop uh, using my wife's really expensive stuff then and just go to the cheaper stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's my problem. I spend too much money on my mustache wax. But there looks, you go. But it looks good. It, looks it good. does. <laughs> well, um, so when's the next Heron Hound or next event that you're going to be at? Uh, I have this coming weekend off, then the weekend after that, I'll be in Laughlin, Nevada for the Best in the Desert Laughlin Hair Scrambles, which okay. is always a fun race, Yeah. as long as you stay away from the Choya, because that, that's evil stuff. <laughs> then the weekend after that, I will probably be at the Big Six uh, at Glen Helen, uh, although outside chance I might go to San Felipe on Saturday for the 250. The 250, right, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you think that works is could make a comeback oh there's no doubt it could yeah i mean they've got a, a from what i understand a new director of operations who has kind of changed the course of uh the, the program that they've got and he's doing a, a good job uh i understand their numbers are, are pretty good so yeah i've, I've heard some uh, i guess some chatter just if nothing else, look, if somebody will post some pictures, you can kind of follow through the comments, and sometimes you can kind of just get a feel for what people are thinking because with the Internet today and comment sections, nobody has a filter. They say what they mean or what they feel, not what they mean. And it, so, But from that, you can kind of decipher a little bit of what's going on. And it sounds like this year and maybe the end of last year that people had uh, – that they've – been much more pleasant about what they've had to say about works and that in yeah. itself i think says a lot because for so long it was just blah, it was just very very negative um so again you're there on the west coast and in the trenches so it's it's interesting to hear that uh, good i'm glad it could make a comeback because that's what we need we need more race series we need more organizations like that for people to be able to get out and enjoy uh, such a fantastic sport so cool well uh yeah again Really appreciate you being on the show and taking the time. Um, hopefully, you're not going to plan on sleeping in that, and you can change into some comfy PJs here in a little bit, right? Well, I, I'm naked from the waist down. Oh, well, <laughs> hey, <laughs> you and me both. You just totally gave away my shtick. <laughs> Nobody realizes that I do these shows <laughs> like just in like half a birthday suit. <laughs> it kind of scares me that you say that because in reality, I don't know if you are. <laughs> Yeah, knowing you, Brian. Oh. oh, no, that's true. Either of us. It could go either way. Who knows what's going on, man? <laughs> I dig it. Well, really appreciate it. And definitely, we're going to be talking soon about more stuff going on the West Coast. So take some more cool pictures and write some good articles, and uh, we'll definitely chat soon. Thank you very much. Awesome. Take it easy, Mark. All right, Brian. <laughs> Bye. All right. Awesome. So we have had a long show again tonight, and lately, We've had a couple long shows, and I don't know if that's good, bad, or indifferent. So in the long run, you guys let me know. How have the shows felt? Have they been too long? Um, I hate to ask, but are they are they not long enough? Um, guest content, things we've talked about. I know some people have been mentioned um, from Arkansas. They'd like us to have Cole Hensley on. Love to talk to Cole. It's little things like that that can help us direct the show for all the viewers out there. Things that you might like us to do different, things like that. Now, if you're just going to be a jerk about it, I'm probably not going to listen. So, you know, be honest, but at the same time, realize that you're talking to a guy who owns and runs the show. Don't be a dick. There you go. So, again, you're watching Seat Time. You can find us. Uh, the website is seattime.co um, if you'd like to be able to find all the archive sites there. Um, so, with that, though, you can follow us on YouTube. Um, if you'd like to watch, it'll tell you when we post all the shows. A neat feature, if you don't know, is you can go to subscribe, um, and there's a setting, and you can click the email um, when a new episode is uploaded. So obviously, like tomorrow morning, this will be uploaded, but it may not get posted to the middle of the day. Well, in that case, you'll get an email 
four hours before it'll make it to the website so you can uh, watch this kind of stuff a little bit earlier or subscribe to us on stitcher or itunes remember search for seat time as two words not one uh we have had a couple people come to us about that um Excuse me. So Facebook, facebook.com slash seat time. You can find us there. We post much more there than just about the site um, of the show. And I think that's a really fun way for us to interact. And it gives us news to talk about. Like one of the things uh, that just recently got released is the prices on the new Huskies. Holy shit, are they expensive. But are they really that much more expensive than new KTMs? Uh, not really. So being that they're going to be the Lexuses of... Um, the KTM world, what does that mean? Um, is a Lexus of a dirt bike, which I kind of always thought, honestly, that the KTM to me was a little bit more higher end, being that ready to race over some of the Japanese manufacturers. So what is this new Husqvarna Lexus of KTM going to bring to us? Um, and, and is the juice worth the squeeze? We haven't had a chance to ride one, but we're going to have Brian Story on, our good friend from SMS Racing, soon. He just got back from the dealer show um, where his uh, shop is going to become a Husky dealer, um, and he's going to come and tell us all about it. So we're going to learn about all the new Huskies, all the stuff that they told him, all the stuff that they told him that hopefully he's not supposed to talk about, and he talks about it anyway, because that's the way we like it to be run on this show. Uh, what other fun stuff? There's been a lot of news. And so it's little things like that. The more active you guys are on a lot of stuff we post on Facebook, the easier it is for me to decipher what I should really kind of go into on the show, maybe even do some more research to, to get more information on. Of course, Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash seat time underscore CEO is our Twitter handle. You could tweet us there. Um, we're on Instagram. It's just one word, seat time. Again, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, all of those uh, social media platforms, you can use the hashtag Pintful of Awesome for a chance to win uh, the Pintful of Awesome award for the week and get your award from Fly Racing. Uh, great swag given away. Loved seeing the picture that we got from TX Moto to TH Moto X from this week, week three. Of course, Fly Racing is a huge supporter of uh, Seat Time, and of course, this weekend we could not be more thankful for all the love and uh, help from the guys over at Fast Company, Flex Bars, Fast Family. Check them out, fastco.com. They are fantastic people. Um, paraphernalia, seattime.bigcartel.com. Please support Seat Time. At least pick up a T-shirt, maybe some koozies. Keep your pint full of awesome. Cool. You can even keep water in these things. It, it really works well. So we appreciate it. Um, anything else on your plate, Stephen? No? I think you finally hit all of it. All of it? That was... Uh, yeah. That was uh, that was the kitchen sink. That was yeah, house cleaning and the kitchen sink. It was all put in there. Well, everybody, thank you very much for watching another episode of Seat Time. If nothing else, have a great night. Always enjoy a pint full of awesome. We'll see you next Tuesday.